But what I like about what we're going to hear today is our brother spoke a message at the Spiritual Mental Health Conference at the Lutheran Church. And I wish more of you made it. I always tell you about good things. Now, there's a conference at his church, June 18 and 19. It's out on the table. Don't miss it if you got time. Focusing on how to focus on the Lord. I think it's a focus on the Lord conference. Can't beat that one. Right at Riverhead. Please take advantage of the good things, if they're all possible. But today, we have the privilege of having Lou Samaritano. Did I say your name right, Lou? Samaritano. Samaritano. Am I close? Samaritano. Very Italian name. Yeah. Maybe that's why he shoots straight from the hip. He doesn't play around. He's Italian. No, I But many people have been blessed by his counseling. You live right in Sayville, if I remember right. Right. Visit the home one time. He's a counselor right in Sayville. And he does a good job of helping people work through their problems with God's Word. So let's give him a warm welcome this morning. He, I know he's intimidated by all these cameras up here. He's got a thousand cameras on him. ABC News. No. Come on up, Lou. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoy the uh, old hymns as a deer pants for the water. When I got saved, I remember just worshiping the Lord with that song, what a beautiful song. Victory in Jesus, amen? Can't go wrong, thank you, uh, music ministers. Appreciate that so much. Thank you, Pastor, Pastor Chris, for inviting me, and uh, as he says, I, I shoot straight from the hip, so if I, hopefully I won't step on too many toes this morning. But more than likely, if I get out of bed, I step on somebody's toes. So. Anyway. I'm going to uh, pray, and then we'll get into God's Word. Father God, we just thank you so much for who you are. Thank you, Lord, that you've created us to know you, Lord. You've given us everything we need for life and godliness. Lord God. And Lord, you didn't uh, do it from afar. But you stepped out of heaven to come to earth to live a life that we could not live, Lord, and to die a death that we deserve to die so that we can have eternal life. But Lord, again, it's not just that. You've given us everything we need in this life but to live a life that truly pleases you and honors you. I pray you help me this morning to help the hearers, Lord God, and help me to hear as well, Lord God, because we're always growing. We're always in need of change and growth. And we thank you, Lord, that you change us from one degree of glory to another as we behold you, Lord God. And we're going to ask for grace now for me, myself, and for the hearers. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. I'm just learning how to use the technology here, so uh, we. Uh, going to open this up. But as I uh, prepared, I was thinking about what to say, and believe it or not, I'm going to say a lot of things that I said at the conference. Um, I added some things and I subtracted some things, but in essence, I want to speak about the sufficiency of God's Word and the power that we receive in the Word of God. Um, there's a lot of voices out there today, a lot of people speaking. Um, I remember myself, before I became a believer, wanting to become a better person and um, <clears throat> listening to, you know, Dale Carnegie was one of the, the guys I went to one of the Dale Carnegie uh, seminars, okay? Read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and um, went to uh, his seminar that was, uh, I think it was a 12-week seminar. Then I remember uh, being a salesperson and wanted to learn how to be a better salesperson and just being a better person. I went to listen, so I listened to Anthony Robbins. I don't know if he's still around, I think he might be. Um, there's so many different voices out there and so many people are telling us the way to live, and they're telling us to 
to listen to their voice. Uh, but sadly, the voices that we're hearing are often turning us away from God and not to God. And the big problem we have is that. The struggle that we have is that we tend to turn away from God. A friend of mine used to say it this way, um, we're like cars with a bad front end. I don't know if you've ever driven a car with a bad front end, but what it does is it, it pulls to one side or the other. So you're in the car, and you're, your hands are on the steering wheel, and all of a sudden you're bearing, you're bearing to the left or to the right. So you have to keep on turning right back to, the, to be in the middle of the road. And that's so true that that's kind of where our hearts tend to be, right? Even as believers, uh, we struggle. There's still a fight, right? To walk in the spirit as opposed to the flesh. And certainly the people of the world are walking in the flesh. Um, there's a verse that I found uh, kind of points to, I think, where we are today. Um, but it didn't just start today. This is the book of Judges, verse 17, 6. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. And if you look at what's going on in the world today, and again, it just didn't start today, right? You can look at throughout history that people have a tendency to go their own way, right? They tend, they tend to want to be their own authority. Uh, and again, we are seeing it, I think, in our nation a lot that authority is being dismissed and none of us like to be told what to do, do we? Okay, but when God tells us what to do, it's always for our good. It's always in love. It's always for uh, purposes that often transcend our thinking. So again, the problem I think that we have, um, and I think why we have so much confusion is because we're turning away from God as opposed to turning to God. And I think um, another big problem we have is we minimize the reality of what happened in the garden. Okay? And I'm not going to go through uh, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, but we know that God created all things, and we know that um, Adam and Eve uh, rebelled against God. Right? Eve, Eve being deceived by the serpent, and then obviously eating the, the forbidden fruit, giving it to her husband, and they both fell. And all humanity since then has been born in, and dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, that's a reality that we often like to minimize. We like to elevate the goodness of man. And certainly we are created, praise God, in the image of God. But that image has been marred because of the fall. And we have to always begin with that reality. Um, because the secularists today don't begin with that reality. They begin with a reality that man is good. So therefore, if there's a problem in man, it must be some kind of biological thing. It must be something of their upbringing. And that certainly all those things can have an effect on people, and we need to be aware of things like that. But the key is, where is the answer? Who has the answer? Another problem, I'm going to talk about the problems and I'm going to talk about the solution. So I don't get too down. <laughs> okay. um, we often call uh, things that are, and uh, Pastor Chris touched on it, things that are uh, sin issues um, and real struggles. I mean, people struggle in this world, right? People struggle, and we, as my brother said, we need to have compassion on all people. No matter what their beliefs, no matter what they're thinking, no matter what they're doing, we, we serve a merciful God, and he's been merciful to us, and we need to have, always show mercy to people. So, um, although I, I am strong in my views, I realize that, first of all, I don't have all the answers. I just believe that God does. <laughs> and um, that's where, that's, that's why my focus is, as a counselor, is to share what God says. I don't know everything that's happening in somebody's life. And they could sit with me for 20 years about their past. Um, they could try to 
to get all kinds of physicals and evaluate their what's going on in their body and hear get doctors reports but ultimately what's who has the solution and what are we called to do again you know it says and again there's the clearest glory uh, Ephesians 5 18 don't get drunk with wine which leads to debauchery now today and again I'm not in any way casting aspersions on people that are struggling because it's a struggle and I realize that I don't have that struggle Chris doesn't have that struggle I, I haven't taken a drink for 25 years and I didn't really have a big problem with it but um, I just felt it's better not to but I don't think biblically I can tell you not to have a drink at a point that's I don't think the Bible says that um, that's that's a personal issue but the bottom line is that they'll what they do is they instead of focusing on the sin issue often with drinking they'll say well it's it's an alcoholism it's a disease um, maybe it's something genetic and I don't know what can happen in somebody's mind and body all I know is this is what God says so let me help you to do what God says whatever whatever reason that it's in your life but if we call it a sickness if we and, and then what happens is we put somebody into a place of helplessness I want to and I believe God's Word gives us hope it gives us hope um, people again gamblers I've heard you know these gamblers anonymous and, and probably the DSM diagnostic statistical manual of mental illness is something that talks about that okay it means it's some kind of an illness or some kind of a disorder um, People that have, you know, other kinds of uh, addictions, maybe overeating, uh, maybe people with anxieties. That again, they're real struggles. They're real human struggles. But um, do we have what we need? Has God given us what we need? The, the Apostle Paul, as my brother quoted, he quoted all the scriptures I've been using. <laughs> um, quoting it from a different version, but all scripture is God breathed, right? Inspired from the, the mouth of God. He spoke it, right? And is able to, right? What does it, what does it do? It's able to teach, and correct, rebuke, and train in righteousness so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, that, that was written, right? Over 2,000 years ago, right? So that was. Was that true then and not true now? Did something change all of a sudden that when Floyd came out uh, and said that, uh, no, it's because you're super ego and you're it and you're all these different things that I don't really understand. To be honest with you, I don't think he understood either, but that's another story. Um, or did we have to wait for Maslow to give us the hierarchy of, of um, you know, whatever different plane that he has of getting to, uh, that place of enlightenment, to the, the pinnacle of success? Or do we have to wait for uh, Carl Rogers, who said, now he, he kind, of, kind of turned around, he said, it's not Freud, it's not Maslow, it's not Skinner, right? It's not with the dog, with the little little dog, with the, you would throw out a piece of meat and say, figure, you can teach people that way. You just give them something good and they'll keep, continue to go for it. And um, so, or, Again, Roger says, well, no, actually, you have the answer. People have the answer. Foy doesn't have the answer. Maslow doesn't have the answer. It's not Skinner. You have the answer in you, right? And you're good because Carl Rogers was a humanist. He believed people were so good. Um, Freud was an atheist, and most of the people of secular psychology were, were atheists. So like I said, we must, we must begin with God. Um, we have to trust him. Um, we have to go to him. If we don't, we're going to be like the people of Israel who um, chose to have no king, right? And then what they do is they start doing what's right in their own eyes. So again, um, as we talked about, the aspect of the fall brings about a number of different issues. The Bible says it this way. You're dead in your transgressions and sins. You're walking, following the course of the world. You're following the prince of the power of the air. These are not my words, God's words. 
sons of disobedience, walking in the passions of our flesh, carrying out desires of body and mind, <coughs> and are by nature children of wrath. And just to, not to leave anyone out, he says, like the rest of mankind. That's where an unbeliever is. Yeah. That's how far we fell from the innocence of the God. <coughs> so you have to say, so therefore am I going to go to a man or a woman who's an atheist to learn how to live? Well, that seems like it would be problematic to do that. So where do we get help from? Um, Psalm 19, I'm just going to touch on this for a second, and a couple of other verses, but it says this. I'm reading from the NIV, so I know it might be a little bit different than some of the other versions. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Okay. Um, it restores, revives the soul, the inner man. Um, it brings true life. Things of the world, the words of the world can't give people true life. Okay? A therapist, a, uh, a psychologist can, can help you to change some outward actions, but can't change the heart. Only God's word, I mean, Chris touched on it before in the class on evangelism. Uh, we can be nice to people, and we can encourage people, and God in his common grace gives us those abilities to do so. But I don't have the power to create things. Remember, God, when he spoke, he created. And when he speaks today, he recreates. Amen? That's what being born again is. Right? If we're Christians, it's not just be that we start changing things that we used to do that we don't do those things anymore it's, and it's not just that we do things that we didn't do it's not that we put off the bad and we put on the good those things yes those are true but it's because of our hearts have changed he's given us a new heart right? he's put a spirit in us he's changed us and i think sometimes we forget not only the fall but what god's done in us we're new creations. That's not just words. That's a reality. But however, although we're new creations, we're still, God's still working in us, right? And he's still changing us. So the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. God's word makes us wise unto salvation. Right? All scriptures, God, be useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. So the man of God may be uh, thoroughly, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It gives us heavenly wisdom, right? Wisdom that changes our character. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. You know, true joy doesn't happen by getting everything we want in this world. Quite the opposite. Jesus says it this way, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. True joy, lasting joy comes as we trust and submit to God's Word. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. You know, the Bible says that people are walking in darkness. So, how do we get light? Freud's not going to give it to us. Maslow's not going to give it to us. Dale Carnegie's not even going to give it to us, right? Um, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light on my path. Psalm 119, 105. The fear of the Lord is pure, clean, enduring forever. It's flawless. The reverential fear of God, right? That's the beginning of wisdom, right? So if we don't have that, we, didn't, we haven't even started yet, right? The ordinances of the, Lord, of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Nothing false, nothing wrong in it. And then the psalmist goes 
on to say this, how much he loves them. They're more precious than gold, than much pure gold. It's sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. And he goes on. By them is your servant warned. God in his love warns us. Sometimes, again, people don't like that God tells us how to live. But why does he do it? Like a parent, a good parent, telling his child or a child, don't go this way. This is, don't put the fork into the, into the, side, into the electric circuit. You're going to get electrocuted, right? Um, and then in keeping them, there's great reward. Great reward. Again, we minimize that. Great reward when you follow the Lord, right? Um, Psalm, or I should say Proverbs 24, 13 through 14, says, My son, eat honey, for it is good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is such to your soul. If you find it, there will be a future for you. And your hope will not be cut off. Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, as you can see, the Bible tells us where the answers truly are. Right? We need to begin, again, in our walk is to be reconciled to God. And as was spoken already, if you haven't come to that place where you've submitted yourself to the Lord and asked for forgiveness, then I would encourage you to do that now because that's the most important thing you can ever do is turn to Jesus Christ and be redeemed. But then we again, we keep on walking. We keep on trusting. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So I would encourage you all to do that if you've not, if you have not, to continue uh, to walk in the reality uh, that God has given us. You know, Jeremiah 2, 12 and 13 says, My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. We must ask ourselves, where are we going for resources, for help? Are we going to the drugstore? Are we going to the next door neighbor that doesn't know God? Are we going to the pastor and say, show me what's in here, this is what I need, right? Are we going to Anthony Robbins? Are we going to Dale Carnegie? Are we going to Oprah Winfrey? I don't know, the, Dr. Phil? I don't know, there's so many things. I, I can't keep track of what's going on. But there's, all they know this is there's 400 and more schools of psychology. Which one is right? If you go to a psychologist, you better figure out which one is right first, right? Really, it's, it's really a ministry to the soul. That's what psychology is, right? But again, does God have what we need? Or did we have to wait for the so-called professionals today um, to come <coughs> to be able to help us? I'm just gonna to touch on one more passage, and that's 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 and 4. And it reiterates what we've been saying all morning. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. They're great and precious. So that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by sinful desires. So, he says a couple of very powerful things here. Beginning with divine power. We, his divine power, God's divine power, has given to us everything we need for life in God. What does that mean? Everything that we need to live this life, okay? To be good husbands and wives, godly husbands and wives. To be good workers to know how to raise our children, okay? 
In fact, even though I even had to eat and drink right, right? Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of the Lord, right? Everything. Now, it doesn't mean, as Chris was saying, it doesn't mean that it tells us how many hours of sleep that we should have. That's not the point, right? It doesn't tell us that we need to eat a healthy diet. Those things are common grace. And I think people have known that you're, you probably should um, eat, right? You, uh, nobody had a, we didn't have to wait for professionals to come and say, well, you better eat. People eat and people know that they need to sleep, right? You get tired, you sleep. And those are valid things. Obviously, if somebody's not sleeping and they come into my office and they haven't slept for three days and they're hallucinating, um, maybe there's a problem, right? Um, the person needs to get some sleep. So God, by his common grace, teaches us a lot of, a lot of things. But everything we need to live a godly life, because I could help somebody in sleeping right and eating right and exercising right, but God's word alone changes the heart Amen. to help us to live a godly life. Elise Fitzpatrick says it well. She says, with plenty of self-help programs to become a good salesperson, a great tennis player, a better speaker, but there's only one agent who can make a person want to be holy, and that's the Holy Spirit, right? It's dynamic power. We know that God's word is inspired by God, right? It's God-breathed, right? It's an amazing statement. The word divine power, we get the word dunamos, okay, where is dynamite in English. That's the kind of power. God's power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. You think about the one that spoke the world into existence and sustained the universe. He's given us help. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. So we don't have to go to other places to be changed, to be godly. We need to go to God. He granted us everything we need. He's given us the provision, and he's given us a purpose, right? To live a life that is godly. And that's where true joy and peace comes from. Not trying to get our own way. Not trying to um, be the most successful person the way the world deems you to be. Not to be able to get the most, as it says, some bumper sticker, right? The, the one that has the most toys, wins, dies, or some kind of silly things. Um, the bottom line is that we're called to have that be reconciled to God and to be transformed by God. And then we can live a life that's truly significant, that's truly purposeful, that's truly joyful. Um, so how does it happen? Through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how, again, that's the beginning, right? And it's not what it says, it says he's given us everything we need for life and God, through the knowledge of him. It doesn't mean that I just know that Jesus is real, okay? I know that Abraham Lincoln is real, but he hasn't helped me today, right? Jesus helps me today, right? A historical figure that's still alive, right? He's in heaven, he's interceding for us, and he's granting us everything that we need. So we need to, again, first and foremost, come to him, okay, through the knowledge of him. But it's, it's not a one-time knowledge. It's not just a, a one-time event that I come to know Jesus. Right? You know, sometimes people get into this where they say, yeah, I, I uh, came to know Jesus 25 years ago, but yeah, my life is the same as it was then. Well, maybe you, don't really, you didn't really know him. Maybe you might have said that you know him, and maybe you think you know him, but have you been reconciled to God through him? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Um, in John 17, 3, Jesus praying to the Father says this, this is eternal life, that they may know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. They would know you, to know God, to know Christ. Uh, so we need to not only know him, we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, which uh, 2 Peter 3.18 tells us. Charles Spurgeon um, said it this way, nothing is so fulfilling, nothing is so humbling, 
nothing so comforting as the knowledge of the Almighty. There were inexhaustible spiritual, emotional, psychological, and intellectual benefits to be had in plumbing the depths of God. Plumbing the depths of God. I want to encourage you all here. Theology is not just for theologians, the high lofty ones that we, you know, the, these great teachers. We're all theologians. It's just so we need the study of God. It's just so we good ones or bad ones. You know, I'm reading a book now on the attributes of God. And I want to know him better. I want to know my Lord better. I want to know the one that I serve. Okay. Very, very important. Um, one who also said it this way, the end is relational. We are forgiven our sins that we might be reconciled to God. We are reconciled to God that we might know God. Right? To know God. Right? This is eternal life. Knowing Him. There's, not, there's no one like Him. There's no one like Him. So very important. And I love what it says here in uh, 2 Peter, that He called us by His own glory and goodness. I believe in the effectual call of God, that He called us and all believers to Himself <clears throat> by His grace, through His own glory and goodness, glory and excellencies. Um, and then it says this, He's given us his very great and precious promises. And I just want to just touch here for a few minutes and then we'll be done. Um, have you ever thought about that? Great, very great and precious promises. Right? What are they? Well, they begin in the beginning, right? Right? God so loved the world that he gave his one and said that whoever believes in him shall not perish. It starts with that. Have everlasting life. Right? He's sealed us. He's given us His Spirit. Right? He's adopted us. Okay? He's given us everything we need for life and God. There's so many things. Right? There's nothing that we're in need of that God has not promised to give us. Right? The Lord is my shepherd. So what? I shall not want. That's a promise. That's a statement. Okay? So, um, again, He's given us his very great and precious promises. And, you know, the more we get to know him, the more we trust what he says, right? The more we can receive those promises and take them to heart and live them out. And again, why is it important to take hold of God's promises? Well, because the world promises us things all the time, doesn't it? Right? Sin promises us things, right? When people sin, why do they promise? Why do they why do they sin? Because they believe that they're going to receive something. Something that's going to satisfy them, right? That's what it does, right? People people sin because they want something. But God tells us, don't follow those words, follow my words. Trust me. Trust the Lord with all my all your heart. Right? Lean not. On your own sin, all your ways acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. A promise, right? So we must battle the lies and the false promises with great and very precious promises that come from God. And I'm just going to touch on a couple. And that that's what you call, as we do that, as we obey and submit to God, that's progressive sanctification. Right? We start to become changed into the image of God in a greater measure. So let's say, I'm just going to give you a couple of uh, promises that maybe today you can take hold of. Maybe this week. Maybe this month. Um, let's say you're, you're tempted to become anxious. Um, Matthew 6, 25, 34 talks about um, that we can trust our Heavenly Father. Right? He takes care of the birds. He takes care of the flowers, right? And if he takes care of those things, is he going to not take care of us, right? Is he going to? Can we trust that he's going to take care of us? So how do we fight against that anxiety? Well, we think about what God has done. We look at. We can just look at outside, and we can see the birds. We can see the flowers. Well, God's doing this. What is he? He's, he's allowing all this to happen. Um, and then it tells us instead of being worried, 
Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Because that's where he wants us to focus on. Or, or in Philippians 4, 6 and 7, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. We should be going to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Maybe you're tempted to feel you can't overcome sin. I get people sometimes tell me, say, I can't overcome that. I say, well, actually, you can. And we're going to help you walk through it. I'm not just going to give people a verse and say, just take this and, uh, you know, take an aspirin and call me in the morning. I'm not going to say that. But I'm just saying that we have to realize that we're believing lies very often. Right? And we need to be changed by the truth of God's word and not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewal of our mind. So no temptation has seized you or taken you except what is common to man. God is faithful. I guess not based on how faithful I am, but truly how faithful God is, right? He's not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. It doesn't mean that we're, we're not going to be faithful. That's not the point. But we're not perfectly faithful, are we? Right? The best of the best are not perfectly faithful. We should endeavor to be faithful. But our faithfulness is built on his faithfulness, is it not? Because we're trusting him. I don't have to fear. Right? Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. That's where my strength comes from. Uh, maybe we're tempted with thoughts and desires of greed. Well, Jesus says it this way, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Okay, why are, you, why are you greedy? Because you think having more is going to satisfy. If I only get an extra $10,000 in my bank account, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be secure. As soon as I get to do the Dave Ramsey plan, well, he's fine. Dave Ramsey's fine. Nothing against Dave Ramsey if he's listening in right now. Um, but the point is, that's not where peace and joy come from. Nothing wrong with saving money. And being a good steward, we should be good stewards of our money, but we can't find, we can't place our hope in that, right? Another verse speaking about money and not being stingy: He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly; he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Again, counter, of counter in the way the world thinks. God's ways are not our ways; they're not man's ways. As high as the heavens above the earth, so are his ways high than our ways, and his thoughts are for us. How about if you're tempted not to obey God's command because you feel drawn to something else? If I, well, I know God says this, but you know something? How about just doing this sin over here? That will really satisfy me. Well, I don't think so, right? In fact, I know not, right? It might satisfy me for a minute, 10 minutes, maybe a day. Maybe a week, but ultimately it's going to cause pain. Now, Jesus said it this way If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I will obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. And I've told you this so my joy may be in you. Want to have a joyful life? There's a command. But there's a promise with the command. Praise God. Right? Tempted to seek other things instead of God? Um, Psalm 37 4 Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart, right? Self-pity, pity, doubt. Maybe you feel like you've been, um, you know, taken advantage of, or maybe the guy that got the promotion, you, you feel like he deserved it, you deserved it. Well, how about this? Psalm 84, 11 through 12. For the Lord God is the sun and the shield. The Lord bestows glory and honor. No good thing. This is really, I love this promise. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Don't worry about getting even. Don't worry about pushing your way in. Walk with the Lord. Right? No good thing does he withhold. It's about him. God's ultimately in control of your life, is he not? Um, o Lord of hosts, blessed is the man or woman that trusts. And again, there's so many of them. Maybe one more. How about you're weary? You're weary maybe because of your sin. Maybe you're weary because you're just struggling with things and you just you don't know where to go. 
Jesus said it this way in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, come to me. And he says that to us today, right? Because as, as we talked about before, his word is living and active, it's alive. These are not just words. These are the words of the living God. Come to me, Lord, you weary and burn. I will give you rest. He's the only one who can really give us rest. It's only one. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle and I'm humble. Hallelujah. At heart, and you'll find rest. If you want real rest? Go to the Lord. He's the one to give you rest. For my yoke is easy. And it's one of the most beautiful promises in the Bible. And it's a real promise. But sometimes people hear it and they see it and they yeah, that's what it says, but I need somebody else to tell me something else. Why don't you listen to what the King of Kings says? The creator of the universe says, right? And I'm talking, I'm speaking to myself too. Again, that's why one of the things I love about counseling, I'm always counseling myself. My wife says I really need it, so that's what I want to talk to say. Anyway, um, one more. And we know this. And we know that all things work for the good for those who love God and call according to his purpose, right? Right? So, we know that God's working sovereignly in every aspect of our life. Um, and he's, again, there's nothing that's out of his purview. And even the bad things, even the struggle, even the pain, as we go to him, he's going to use it somehow for good. Somehow he's going to do something good for uh, the ones that really seek him. John Bunyan, in his best-selling book, Pilgrim's Progress tells about how Christian, who was on the journey to the celestial city, which is heaven, was thrown into Doubting Castle. Have you ever been in Doubting Castle? You ever feel doubts and fears and wonder, how am I going to get out of here? How do I deal with this? What's going to happen tomorrow? Doubts, fears. So he was in Doubting Castle. And he was held by giant despair, right? Um, after being there for three days and nights, he cried out to his friend, Hopeful. Right? Sometimes we need a friend called Hopeful, right? <laughs> Somebody to encourage us on, say, come on, keep running, don't give up. God's, God's going to get you through this. God's going to redeem all the struggles you have. And he cries, he cries out <coughs> because what happened is he, he says this, uh, what a fool I am to lie in this stinking dungeon when I can walk in liberty. I have a key in my pocket, and the key is called Christ. And he takes it, and he goes to the door of Daddy Hot Castle, and that promise opens up the door, and he goes out. And I just want to leave you guys with that, and yeah. consider that. Don't just read over these promises. Look for them. Look for them. They're staggering promises because they come from the creator of the universe. And he doesn't just talk. A lot of times we just talk. When God talks, you can trust. Okay? Because he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we ask or think. Charles Spurgeon, and I'll end with this quote. God's promises are like grapes in the wine press. If you will tread them, the juice will flow. Okay? If you tread them, the juice will flow. Mull over God's promises and truths. Chew them as a cow chews its cud. Receive the riches of these truths, these very great and precious promises. And where did they come from? in the sufficient, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. Amen? Amen. Father God, I just thank you for who you are. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Bless these people with a greater desire to know you and to take hold of your precious promises in your all-sufficient life. In Jesus' name.